What if you could dramatically increase your rental income, maybe even double it with just a few simple tweaks? I'm Kathy Fetke and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Well, most of us know that the short-term rental space can yield a lot more than a long-term rental. However, we also know that a lot of cities are cracking down on short-term rentals. So how can you still up your returns while still being compliant? Mid-term rentals. 30-day leases do not fall under the same regulations as short-term rentals and is a great way, again, to up your returns. Our guest today, Jeff Hurst, is the president and CEO at Furnished Finer an online booking platform that was formerly catering to traveling nurses, but now has expanded to anyone looking for a longer-term, short-term rental. Jeff brings an enormous amount of experience to his role at Furnished Finder. As former CEO of the Expedia Group, and before that, president at Verbo, and played a crucial role as chief strategy officer at Home Away, overseeing the company's successful sale to Expedia. And he's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show to give us the ins and outs of midterm rentals today. Welcome, Jeff. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Kathy. Yeah, Furnish Finder has really taken off over the past few years. So tell me a little bit about how you got started and, you know, why. Sure. So Furnish Finder just celebrated its 10th birthday uh, last month. Uh, Wow. It was founded um, 10 years ago by a... uh, basically a medical practitioner. And what he did was he was getting engaged and had one place he needed to rent out after he got married. And so Brian Payne and his wife uh, ended up founding Furnish Finder to solve that problem. It feels a lot like the way VRBO was founded in the 90s. And for a long time, they were just catering to traveling medical. Um, And COVID, traveling medical became a huge tenant class. And so a lot of people joined the platform. And we went from about 30,000 homes to over 300,000 today uh, in a period of just a few years. And really taken off because the major platforms like uh, Airbnb or Verbo, where I used to be president, charge pretty large fees to landlords to find guests. And we don't charge any booking fees. And so it's a very retro model where you basically pay us a subscription fee annually. And then we give you leads to go convert into tenants. And it's a focused on 30 day plus rentals. And so it avoids a lot of the regulatory conundrums that short term has found itself in in major urban. I was just going to bring up regulation. Are cities more open to the 30 day rental versus the short term? Are you seeing still some of the same pushback? No, definitely more open. And so in general, what happened with short term regulation was cities across the U.S. either put in a 30 day, basically hard stop. So anything under 30 days was illegal and anything over 30 days is legal. Or they put in, you know, kind of a cap system, almost like taxi medallions, where there were a certain number of licenses available for short term, but it's usually unlimited licenses for 30 day plus. There's not meaningful distinction legally in most markets around the difference between a 30 day rental and a 365 day rental. And so it's kind of like the official lease process starts at 30 days. And most of what our landlords are doing is signing a just traditional landlord lease. And it just happens to have 30 days or 90 days, which is the most common booking time frame, as opposed to a full year. And so you provide the lease? We provide you- uh, connectivity through partners to basically get market-specific leases that you can add your own amendments to. If perhaps you want to have a pet amendment or something like that. And so we provide our landlords tools for uh, digital lease signatures, uh, for payments if they want to do payment processing through Stripe. We have a waiver product so people don't have to deal with the hassle of security deposits and gives you some extra protection for things like lost income. And then we've got partnerships to help people find the right landlord insurance so you're not using traditional homeowners. But the majority of what we do is, you know, a marketplace to help tenants find landlords. And that's what our subscription covers. Yeah, I mean, you tell me or explain this to me better, but uh, I understand if the if you go over 30 days, then if the tenant doesn't leave, you're faced with eviction versus you wouldn't really necessarily have to deal with that on a short-term rental or what's the difference there? 
Uh, I don't think there's a meaningful legal distinction between those two. And so if someone's a short-term rental and stays long enough to have squatter's rights versus being in a um, midterm or long-term rental, it's pretty much the same. I think the big advantage of midterm rentals and platforms like ours is that the, uh, the screening is all up to the landlord. And so you're not just accepting an instant booking and someone shows up and you hope for the best. And so most people go through a tenant screening process that includes, you know, eviction histories and criminal background checks. And even you can do credit reporting and things like that to be sure you're getting who you want. And it's actually pretty frequent that people will meet the tenant before they move in to get a better read on who's actually showing up. And then lastly, you're paying a full month's rent in advance for someone who you know might have nefarious intent it's a lot different than paying for two days and then just staying. And so Mm -hmm. we don't hear a lot of complaints about it. I'm sure it happens just like it happens in long-term, but I don't think it's nearly the epidemic that it is in short-term. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. We, I mean, we haven't had any issues in short-term, but we don't have that many. Um, So your background was with Verbo? Is that Uh, right? Yes. I used to be the, uh, I was the chief strategy officer at HomeAway when it was a public company. And then I was the president of uh, Verbo. And then I was the chief operating officer at Expedia Group, and I took a little bit of time off and worked with uh, Summit Partners to actually uh, take a position in buying Furnish Finder. And so now we manage it with the original founding team and partners at Summit. Wow. Well, I can understand now how they were able to grow so quickly with you on board. You probably experienced that. Did did Verbo and Home, Home Away was Home Away uh, parent company of Verbo. Oh, okay. Uh, did they also see that kind of massive growth during uh, since 2020? Um, short-term rentals definitely had a boom in 21 and 22. You know, a lot of the hotels were basically closed and everyone was mm-hmm. in more isolation. And so there was a boom both on the buy side and also on the rental side. Uh, it's come back to earth quite a bit. And so occupancy is down a little bit and rates are down some also. Uh, on the midterm side, you are actually still kind of like I, I compare it to, you know, it's like 2014 and short term short term rentals because it's a new and growing category and it's solving a very different problem. And so it's solving a problem where people need to relocate for longer periods of time or people are currently locked out of the housing market and they want to try before they buy and be sure they get the right thing so that they're not, you know, feeling rushed into a decision of picking up a mortgage at an expensive expensive interest rate. Almost 25% of our renters are actually people relocating and they'll go live somewhere for two, three, four months, and then they'll figure out what they want to do next, whether that's buy or get a long-term rental, or there's people who are remodeling a home or maybe selling a home and need temporary furnished housing while they figure out what's next. So if somebody were to sign up on Furnished Finder, what would they what would be different than um, say Airbnb or Verbo's 30-day program? Aren't they trying to do something like that? They do do this. Uh, Airbnb has, I think they say about 15 to 20 percent of their total nights booked are for 30 or more nights. And so it's pretty big there. Um, the big difference is that you basically you have control as a landlord. You're not mm-hmm. giving control over to the platform where they might they don't let you talk on the phone to someone before they check in. They don't let you choose who you are and aren't going to accept with products like their instant booking, which is you know pretty much required to be successful. And so it puts a lot more control in the landlord's hands. It does put a little bit more work in the landlord's hands because you're doing more of the screening and such yourself. But that's the primary difference. You know, it still looks kind of the same. You know, you've got a map and you see a lot of homes on it. And you can filter and pick which one you like. And tenants are going to reach out and try and book your property. So you said you provide a lot of tools. Do you also provide um, tools for the screening process? We do. And so we have a partnership with TransUnion where the landlord basically sends a request to the tenant. And then the tenant pays for the screening and the landlord gets the results. Oh, that's fantastic. So you've, it sounds like you've, I I remember trying Furnish Finder years ago and it seemed a little, um, um, how do I say it? Uh, not as uh, high tech. Yeah. We, not as high tech. It's, it's a natural beauty. And so we are uh, in the process of being sure it gets all the, uh, you know, all the makeup and jewelry and everything it needs to feel more modern. Um, and so that's a big part of what me and the team have been doing since I joined a year ago is really modernizing the technology so that the experience feels more fresh and like what tenants and landlords are accustomed to if they've been using Airbnb more. But you oh, know, that's it has traditionally been a little bit more work and we're trying to remove that work and really focus on, you know, you can save 
for our average tenant, you're probably saving a week's take home pay. If you book with us for all of your professional stays, instead of using Airbnb, because that 10% adds up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's exciting to hear that there's going to be some upgrades um, and exciting to, to hear that there's more, perhaps more money, more funds to do it. It always seemed like a mom and pop thing, which it was and yeah. very cool and, and focused on helping the um, medical industry, mainly traveling nurses, right? In the beginning. Right. And so traveling nurses are still big for us. They're, um, mm-hmm. I think they're our second biggest tenant group. In general, you see, you know, traveling for work, which is typically small business or people who are relocating on a stipend. And then you have healthcare, then you have relocations then academics. And then uh, the last use case would basically be what we call digital nomads or long-term. They're people who actually live in furnished finders and they take 90, 120 days at a time and just move around the U S. So before there was this kind of platform or technology, there was, there's always been corporate housing. Uh, Is that still out there or do those kinds of companies now work with people like you? I think that the corporate agents would work with people like us, but corporate Mm -hmm. housing is still a very big category. And so, you know, you can think of it on one side, there's the longer stay hotels like extended stay America and pretty much every brand has different kind of star ratings of that. And then there's corporate housing, which would be more the multifamily developers where they might build a complex, but have five or 10 units available for corporate and they're furnished. Uh, They're typically uh, quite a bit more expensive than what we'd have on our platform. And a lot of what our platform is doing is it really just removes a lot of that management fee component so that tenants and landlords can keep more of their own money. And so our platform is overwhelmingly entrepreneurial individual landlords. I think the average landlord on our platform you know, has about 1.3 properties. And so you know, it is really kind of a mom and pop. And so there's a lot more value that can be kept by the tenant and the landlord compared to the layers of management fees and REIT fees and, you know, HOA fees and all of the things that might go into more traditional corporate housing. Yeah. Okay. So if someone, we have a lot of real estate investors who listen to the Real Wealth Show, that's our audience, and they might be considering this, like they might have a long-term rental that's doing okay, but they'd like to increase cash flow because obviously expenses have gone up. Um, So I'm assuming that um, with a furnished rental, you're going to get a lot more than a long-term rental. That's, That's right. right. So what's typically the difference in income? Uh, we typically say it's, you know, on the low end, it's one and a half times your long-term rate uh, up to as much as two times your long more rate, long-term rate or more. Uh, but one and a half to two X is kind of the right benchmark. Uh, it depends, you know, like all things real estate, it depends on location and fit out and who you're targeting. But, you know, I actually think of it more as what's the return on buying some furniture. And so if you're actually already furnished, then moving to a midterm model is probably just more yield. And then the alternative might be you're thinking about furnishing a place and, you know, about 70 percent of our inventory is two bedroom or less. And so it's not that expensive to furnish. And it's also not furnishing a short term rental. You're not trying to wow someone for this. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. What's the difference? It's people aren't going on vacation. They're they're living. Yeah, it's more functional. You you need a, Mm -hmm. a quiet place to work and to sleep and to basically manage your commute. Or you're more in almost a period of distress where maybe you're getting your house remodeled or you've got something that's taking too long before you can move in or even an insurance claim where there's damage to your home. You really are focused on location and managing your own commute much more so than that you're trying to get the nicest place possible. You know, you're trying to get a place that really manages you through a difficult time. And so, you know, as an investor, I think of it as twofold. On the long term side, it's almost like what's the cash return on furniture? And that is, I think. A very fast payback in our market, in particular, if you're in uh, a place where there is a lot of corporate commuting. And then if you're coming from short term, there's not a lot of inventory overlap. You know, this isn't the Florida Gulf Coast as a hotbed for us. We're much more Mm -hmm. uh, suburbs and small, medium cities. Think of it as like anything around good schools, good hospitals, good universities that tends to or good commuter corridors. But the exciting thing about that is you can actually buy these for a lot less cash than a short-term rental. And so you can be in a position to basically pick up a duplex or a quadplex that might have three midterm rentals and a long-term and manage these for cash much faster than you could on the short-term side, where you're usually playing a little bit more of an appreciation game or even a usage game. You know, I just want to pay part of this because I want to be there myself. Fascinating. So I know, again, when I was checking out the site and I don't know why, I, I just kind of stopped maybe because it was harder at the time, but 
it seemed like you needed to be within, I don't know what, 20 minute commute from a hospital at the time for the traveling nurses. Is that changed or, you know, is there more, are, are nurses also need needed at the smaller medical offices that might not be a big hospital, but just in a suburb somewhere? Yeah. The, the big thing that's changed is kind of, you know, think 2022, you know, kind of peak COVID 70 to 80 percent of our tenants were traveling nurses. And mm-hmm. now that number is more like 25 to 30 percent. Oh, my goodness. So wow. We have a much larger, more diverse group of tenants. And so traveling for work would be the most common non-medical traveling for work where you're more likely solving for are you near a commuter corridor? You know, are you near where businesses to where you can get in and out? And then it's traveling healthcare, And then it's actually relocations where it's, it's prim- primarily around schools. You know, what school districts are there? And, you know, can I help someone solve for keeping their kids close to their elementary and their regular commute pattern? Oh, so you're seeing more family. families. Yes, we are. Okay. Because it, it always seemed like, um, at least when I interviewed some interim people that was smaller units, even one bedroom units would be okay because it was a traveling nurse traveling alone or maybe with her husband. 50% of inventory is one bedroom or smaller. But then another 40% is two and three bedroom. And so we're growing more into that two, three bedroom. There's not really the use case you have in short term rentals of four or five, six bedroom, sleep 15 or 20. Mm. But we're getting a lot more of the, you know, family of four point X people. And they're hoping to have a three bedroom because they're waiting to figure out where they're going to live or to have their house remodeled. And how do you find out about saturation? How do you know if you're going to have too much competition in the area from others doing this? You know, I I think it's similar tools as the other asset classes. And so on one hand, you look at Airbnb and you can get a feel for that from some of the third party tools like AirDNA. On the other Mm -hmm. hand, you look at the Zillows of the world and you can get a feel for where uh, rents are from those platforms. And then, of course, ours. And so you can use our map and get a feel for, you know, how much inventory is there like mine on the map when I do a search for tomorrow? And what does that actually mean? The, um, I think the, the saturation, you know, where I see people getting up, hung up on our platform is more that they've got a four bedroom in Crested Butte than want it to be on Furnished Finder. And there's not a lot of commute there. It's more leisure. Um, when I see people with one and two bedrooms and it's, you know, urban, suburban, or even like a commuter corridor, like in Texas, Waco would be, in a, good, be a good example. Places where there might not be as much lodging. Um, there's a good opportunity in those places because there's also a better value proposition in terms of what it costs to get in. And so I haven't seen a huge saturation concern. And you you kind of have the the fallback plan is actually pretty good because the fallback plan is make it a long-term rental. And so you don't have as much of this seasonality and variability you have on the short-term side. Yeah. So for long-term rentals, we're always looking for places with job growth, with population growth, infrastructure growth. I mean, infrastructure is the big one. I would think for midterm is you've got, if you've got infrastructure growth, you've got workers coming in maybe for a short period of time to, to work on the building of those things. Are those the same metrics that, uh, that an investor would look at when choosing a property? Be, I think it would be, you know, 90% the same. Um, and mm-hmm. the, you know, the only difference might be we've got probably a bit more bent towards the affordable and that a lot of people are traveling on stipend. And so they're really looking in a very specific budget as to what they need. And that pushes probably a little bit more people into the, you know, you talked about 20 minutes from a hospital. You know, people might be more willing to live in one of these where the commute's 30 minutes, whereas if it was their full time residence, they might be optimizing for something shorter. Okay. So, Ideally, 20 to 30 minutes from the job center. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, I know we already talked about this, but are you seeing restrictions to 30 days? I I know in a development that we have, uh, you're allowed to short term rental uh, with a week minimum and anything after that is fair game. But I've heard rumors that some neighborhoods, some HOAs don't even want the 30 day rental. Yeah, I I think there's there's not the same overwhelming amount of evidence like there is for short terms in less than 30. Uh, the only place I'm okay. aware of anything substantial is Hawaii. Uh, some of the islands put in place longer duration stays to basically create more long-term housing. Um, and I've heard of a few HOAs doing it, but I haven't heard of any cities doing it yet or states outside of Hawaii. Okay. That's great. 
What are some of the markets that um, are undersupplied, in your opinion, where there's more demand than than uh, maybe what's out there? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, top markets look a lot like top markets everywhere. Seattle's a huge market for us, and um, Phoenix is a huge market for us. You know, some interesting ones I thought were Maine is actually a very under-indexed state for us. And so you see a lot of places in Maine where there are smaller towns that have a commute profile and we've been having like through the roof um, demand per property. Um, we see, uh, you know, when I look at it and I haven't bought a midterm rental yet, I still have short term rentals from uh, from my last job. I think a lot of the most interesting things are like think about population hubs that might be 50 to 150,000 people um, and where you believe in the long term trends you were talking about, construction and growth. And so in Texas, it might be Temple and Colleen. It might be places between San Antonio and Austin or between Austin and Dallas like Waco. I think those become really interesting. And a lot of that is that you don't really have the same, you know, to what you're describing, saturation. You don't have as many people who are playing there, but you are starting to see more jobs and more mobility happen there. Okay, wonderful. Do you have, I know one of the tools on Airbnb is now they offer property managers or referrals to them. Do you have anything like that or recommendations to a, a property manager if you don't want to be the one screening? Yeah, so Airbnb launched co-host marketplace. It's new. I actually think it's a really interesting idea. Um, you know, the hosting on Airbnb would typically cost about twenty five percent, and you know, in a mountain town, it might be as high as fifty percent for the management fees. What we see in midterm rentals is that's closer to fifteen or even ten. Usually, there's one of the local real estate brokerages will have a property management team who is willing to do furnished in addition to unfurnished rentals. And so I would say you start by looking for people who do unfurnished management and have them approach them about managing these for you. Uh, I have not found a great end-to-end -end list, um, but almost every major metro has a realtor brokerage who's willing to do long-term management. And because of that midterm, you know, it's really an extra two or three turns a year for twice the rent. And so I think it's really appealing. And I think it's going to be a really hot growth space is that there is going to need to be more people step into this management role to figure out who's going to fill the void. There's not, it's not a lot of effort and it can be a nice return and a nice source of leads for people who are also in the buy, sale, buy sell side of real estate. Well, this has been really fascinating and exciting um, to, for you probably to be a part of a company that's growing so quickly and just at the beginning of that. Yeah, I'm just thrilled that so many people are going to be able to participate in, you know, kind of wealth creation. And also it's a, um, you know, in, the, in your short term rental podcast you did a few weeks ago, they talk about neighborhood nuisance. This is much more of a neighborhood asset. You know, if you've got a friend mm -hmm. whose house burns down or who has roof damage and needs a place to stay, you're thrilled that there's a house that might have been an estate sale house in your neighborhood that's now available, furnished, so they can live there or that people can do a remodel and not have to move into, you know, corporate housing on the other side of town. And so we're really excited about what we're doing. And we think it's a really interesting investment space because there's so much tenant momentum behind it. Yeah, I, another great option is, you know, being near a new home development because we have a, a townhome that we put on the short term rental, but it's always renting for midterm for people whose houses are not finished. Like, like you said, or they right. need, they sold their house and they, they've got some time in between. So ours is just Construction constantly always rented. Long. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, good. thank you so much for joining me here on The Real Well Show, Jeff. It's been a pleasure to, to have you here and best of luck to you all. Thank you so much. And we'll talk again soon. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Well Show. If you're looking for a team to help you source property that can work as a long-term, short-term, or medium-term rental, just go to realwellshow.com and you'll get access to our long list of resources for real estate investors. It's free to join and we get paid in a broker-to-broker -broker relationship so our members don't have to pay us. I'm Kathy Fedke. Thanks again for joining us here on The Real Well Show and we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.